Hey guys, welcome back. In the previous videos, we have learned how ICP and AES work. The next question will be, what is this experiment about? In this video, we will take a closer look at the experimental design. In this experiment, we will learn how to use ICP AES to perform elemental analysis of trace metals in water samples in a real world context. For the sample collection, you may bring your own samples from household water or campus water. You may also communicate with your lab mates to come up with your own mini research project. For example, to analyze water samples collected from different regions in Singapore or from different buildings in campus. For the sample preparation, we will learn how to treat and preserve the water samples collected using nitric acid. And we will use multi-element standard to perform external calibration and to spike our sample to investigate if the metric interference is within the acceptable range. In the lab, you will have chance to learn how to set up the auto sampler and we will show you how the different parts of the ICP instruments look like. You will also have hands-on experience operating the machine and see how the plasma is being generated. Finally, for the data analysis, we will learn how to compute the percentage recovery to examine the metric interference. And we will compare our experimental data with the WHO guidelines for drinking water quality to see if the water sample are safe for consumption. As mentioned previously, this experiment is a little bit different from the traditional teaching lab experiment. We call design this experiment with your seniors. We integrated authentic learning in this experiment to bring real-world practice, particularly the EPA protocols for ICP AES analysis of water sample into the classroom. In addition, in order to promote student motivation for learning, we also incorporated autonomy and relevance in this experiment. You may choose water sample relevant to your everyday life for the ICP AES analysis. Let's start with the sample collection. As mentioned, you may bring your own sample. You may choose to collect water sample from your home or from campus. Each student may choose one sample. Two to four groups of students will be conducting this experiment together. Depending on the group size, we may analyze six to 10 water samples per lab session. Each student may collect three centrifuge tubes for the sample collection from the lab officers. Try collecting the sample fresh on the lab day itself. If you plan to collect household water, you may collect the centrifuge tube during the previous lab session. For the sample preparation, we need to preserve and treat our water sample with nitric acid. And we will be using a strange filter to remove any solids from our samples. So why do we use nitric acid in this case? Why not hydrochloric acid? Let's discuss about it in the lab. At this point, you may be wondering, what if you need to perform ICP AES analysis of a solid sample next time during your internship or at work? Solid sample cannot be introduced into the plasma directly. They have to be transferred into the plasma using electrothermal vaporization laser ablation, or they must be made into a solution using acid digestion first. Acid digestion usually involves the dissolution of a solid sample in a hot acid. For example, if we would like to analyze soy samples, we will need to dry the sample and grind them into smaller particles. Then we can treat the sample with aqua regia, which is a 1 is to 3 mixture of nitric acid and hydrochloric acid followed by heating the mixture using a microwave digestion system that employs pressurized vessel to produce an even higher extraction temperature. This method enables us to effectively extract most elements from the soil sample. Finally, we need to remove any remaining solids using gravity filtration and a string filter to prevent clogging the sample introduction system in ICP. So this is how the sample preparation looks like drying and grinding the sample to reduce the particle size, microwave digestion with hot acid to extract the elements from the soil sample, filtering off any remaining solid to prevent clogging the sample introduction system. 
This diagram here shows an atomic emission spectrum of a Martian rock obtained from the rover Curiosity. As we can see here, each element has a set of characteristic emission wavelengths, as indicated on the x-axis. And on the y-axis, we have the counts, which represent the emission intensity. Then the next question would be, how do we determine the concentration of each element present in our sample from the emission intensity of their characteristic line spectra? In other words, how do we perform quantitative analysis using ICP-AES? Well, the answer is through an external calibration, which most of us are already familiar with. In this experiment, we'll be using multi-element standards containing these 13 elements of interest. Based on the ICP-AES results of the multi-element standards, we can plot calibration curve with emission intensity on the y-axis against the concentration of the multi-element standards on the x-axis. For example, in this case of silver, if the emission intensity obtained at 328 nanometer is 4000 unit, using the calibration curve, we can back calculate the concentration of silver present in the unknown sample. In this experiment, we will use the calibration curves of all 13 elements of interest. Don't worry about it. The software will help us plot these calibration curves automatically. So far, we have talked about how to preserve and prepare the water sample by treating them with nitric acid. And we have discussed how to perform quantitative analysis using external calibration with multi-element standards. The last type of sample preparations involve spiking the sample with a known amount of multi-element standards. So why do we need to spike our samples with a known amount of multi-element standards? Let me ask you these questions. How do we know if the unknown concentration obtained from the calibration curve is accurate? Is there any disadvantage of using external calibration? The major disadvantage of using external calibration is the presence of matrix interference. So, what is matrix? Matrix is everything in the sample solutions other than the analyte. If you are dealing with simple sample, for example, the standard solutions we prepare in the lab, the matrix interference is usually quite minimal. However, if you are dealing with real-world sample, the matrix interference may be quite significant because the matrix itself can be very complex. Because the matrix may interact with the analyte to increase or decrease the instrumental response, therefore, the quantitative analysis may not be accurate. Then the next question will be, how do we minimize matrix interference? Well, let's talk about this in the next video. See ya!